This presentation is a response to a report published by Amnesty International alleging that in the summer of 1988, the Iranian authorities carried out the mass executions of many thousands of peaceful political dissidents, mostly from the People's Mujahideen organization. Amnesty claims that these actions amount to crimes against humanity and has asked the United Nations to investigate and bring those responsible to justice. The report itself appears to have been commissioned and supported by the People's Mujahideen itself, widely regarded as being a terrorist group, but portrayed in a very positive light by Amnesty. If this is so, then it would be the first time a human rights support has been written on behalf of a terrorist organization, itself guilty of human rights abuses. Although it focuses on the events of 1988 in Iran, it actually is a broader polemic against the entire political establishment of the Islamic Republic over the last four decades and tries to connect every political figure to the events of 1988 and indict them in the process. Interestingly, reformist figures like Mir Hussein Musavi, Hashemi Rafsanjani and Abdullah Nouri received greater criticism than conservative ones like Ayatollah Khamenei and Revolutionary Guard commanders. As such, it really amounts to advancing an agenda for regime change in that there will never be justice done to the families of the victims of the alleged executions until the current system is overthrown and all those responsible are sent to The Hague. The Iranian government itself has not responded to the accusations made by Amnesty, understandably so, as this would give these accusations the oxygen of respectability that they do not deserve. However, given the relentless Iranophobia in the Western media, I feel the need to respond in kind. In Persian, we have a saying, Sukut alamate rizast, which means that to stay silent is to agree. And I certainly do not agree with most of the unsupported and distorted claims made in this report. So on December 4th, 2018, Amnesty held a press conference in London to announce the publication of its report, Blood Soaked Secrets, describing the events in Iran of 1988 along with its own recommendations to the United Nations. Attending the event was the Secretary General Kumi Naidu, Amnesty's Research Director for Middle East and North Africa, Philip Luther, and Raha Bahraini, Amnesty's lead Iran researcher. As far as I can tell, Ms. Bahraini effectively wrote most of the report. Also contributing to the research was Shadi Sadra of Justice for Iran. Ms. Sadra is a leading opposition activist and proponent of regime change. According to Alex MacDonald of Middle East Eye, she in fact revealed the objective of the report, which was to, and I quote, show why and how the Islamic Republic is in power by killing thousands of dissidents. Amnesty claims that it is impartial and nonpartisan, but at least as far as this report is concerned, that clearly is not the case. So according to Amnesty International, in July of 1988, uh, a little over a week after Iran accepted the terms of United Nations Security Resolution 598, uh, which called for an immediate ceasefire uh, between Iran and Iraq, uh, Iran's then Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini issued a fatwa, or religious edict, ordering the mass extrajudicial executions of many thousands of peaceful dissidents only on account of their political and religious beliefs. The aim, Amnesty alleges, was to exterminate, once and for all, uh, the political opposition to the Islamic Republic, mostly consisting of leftist groups like the People's Mujahideen, but also ethnic separatists like uh, the Kurdish Democratic Party and uh, Komala. Uh, it also alleges that the Iranian authorities carried out these mass executions in complete secrecy and that they have ruthlessly concealed what happened ever since. This has included threatening the families of the victims who have been arrested with torture, merely for asking for the burial locations of their loved ones. Uh, this horrific account, Amnesty alleges, amounts to a crime against humanity, and this is why the United Nations uh, is duty-bound to investigate. Now, as we'll discover, these findings of the report are little more than distortions, uh, half-truths, and at times complete fabrications. One of the most contemptible and despicable aspects of this report by Amnesty is that there has been an attempt to whitewash the violent and criminal nature of the People's Mujahideen, 
making them out to be largely peaceful dissidents who took part in non-violent demonstrations and the distribution of political leaflets. It does acknowledge that the group uh, assassinated several government officials in 1981, but it treats that really as being an aberration, uh, something not reflective of the group's uh, true nature. It also seems to blame the government, in fact, for provoking the group into these acts of violence through its uh, alleged repression and uh, persecution. Now, the reality, of course, is that the People's Mujahideen is a murderous terrorist cult, uh, now headed by Mariam Rajavi, but uh, formerly by her husband, Masood. And it's killed more than 12,000 Iranians. Let me repeat that, 12,000 Iranians over the course of the last four decades, according to the Habilin Association, an NGO. The Habilin Association has meticulously documented every single one of those uh, 12,000 Iranians killed and uh, the circumstances uh, in which they died as well. Now, the People's Mujahideen has also killed thousands in Iraqi Kurdistan in 1981 when Saddam used it to crush an uprising there following his defeat in the Gulf War. And if you don't believe the Habitian Association, I suggest you look at the U.S. State Department's uh, report on terrorist groups in 1984, which states that, according to the group's own admission, it has killed thousands it considers to have been agents of the Iranian regime during the 1980s. Now, much of the information contained in the report depends in large part on the testimonies of Mujahideen members who were formerly prisoners in Iran at the time of the wave of executions. And for this purpose, Amnesty's researchers visited a camp in Albania where some 2,300 Mujahideen are based, having been evicted from Camp Ashraf in Iraq, where they previously resided. Amnesty made no less than three trips to this camp in Albania. However, it is widely known that gross human rights abuses take place there. As Lindsay Hilsom of Channel 4 News reported in a documentary, former members at this camp, defectors who now live in the Tirana area, claimed that they were indoctrinated and tortured at the camp. They also claimed that the, 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 the leadership told members what to say uh, at all times, which raises a very interesting question as to whether the testimonies that Amnesty got from these, these camp members can be relied upon if they were in fact made under duress. The second uh, point is that whether Amnesty are in fact complicit in uh, human rights violations by being completely indifferent to them Amnesty is supposed, on the other hand, to expose human rights abuses, not to conceal human rights abuses. And the fact that they are so willing to take uh, testimonies from, from, from people who have maybe, may have been tortured and indoctrinated is very, very worrying indeed. The report makes a fleeting reference to an armed incursion by the Mujahideen into Iran in July of 1988 called Amaliyat Furuga Javadan, Operation Eternal Light that was itself met by a counter-offensive of the Iranian armed forces called Amaliyat Mersad, Operation Ambush. But the report stops there. It doesn't actually say what happened in the ensuing confrontation or whether anyone was killed. It is astonishing that the report has more to say about the fighting in a Kurdish rebellion in 1979 as part of its wider review of the political history of the Islamic Republic, but as little to say about the major backdrop to the events of the summer of 1988. Now, the reality is that on the 25th of July, five days after Iran accepted the UN-mandated ceasefire, 7,000 Mujahideen fighters crossed from Iraq into Iran with the support of Saddam Hussein, who had equipped them with tanks, APCs, and mobile artillery. The Iraqi Air Force also provided air support. It was more than just an, an, an incursion. It was a full-scale invasion. Now, the invading force poured into three Iranian provinces, namely Elam, Kermanshah, and Kurdistan. It succeeded in seizing a number of border cities like Mehran, and from there the Mujahideen planned on marching on the capital city, Tehran, and overthrowing the government. The Iranian forces fell back and lured the Mujahideen into a mountain range from where they bombed them from the air and attacked them from the ground. The battle turned out to be a complete massacre, and it is estimated that between 2,000 and 3,000 Mujahideen fighters were killed. To the horror of the Iranian soldiers, many of them were women, as can be seen in the graphic and quite distressing photos here. Those who were captured either took cyanide pills and committed suicide, uh, or they were court-martialed and summarily executed as traitors and unlawful combatants. 
it defended the country from the, this invasion. The Iranian government, of course, did nothing wrong as far as international law or indeed Iranian military law is concerned. Operation Mehrsad is widely celebrated in Iran today as the ambush of God, and those who fought in the battle are hailed as heroes. It is extraordinary that Amnesty should leave this out of its report, which is tantamount to lying by omission. The reason for this, however, is quite straightforward. The Iranian authorities have always maintained, as Amnesty itself relates, that the majority of the Mujahideen who died in 1988 were in fact killed on the battlefield, or soon after being captured on the battlefield, and not in jail. So the fact that so many Mujahideen actually died in this way detracts and distracts from the narrative peddled by Ms. Bahraini. The report alleges that the authorities did not in fact return the bodies of those prisoners they executed to their families for proper burial, but instead disposed of them in mass graves scattered throughout the country. Amnesty claims that this in itself amounts to a heinous crime. It refers to the discovery of one of these mass graves in Elam province where the body of a woman was found in a makeshift trench wrapped in a plastic shroud and horrifically exhibiting multiple gunshot wounds on her. However, Elam province is one of the three provinces where Operation Mersod took place and it is more likely that this is the remains of a female Mojahedin fighter killed in battle and not that of an executed prisoner. The Iranian armed forces did in fact dispose of the Mojahedin war dead in unmarked mass graves and made no attempt to identify the corpses, many of which were in fact unrecognizable. Now the report also mentions that 378 graves have been identified at Behesht Zahra, Tehran's largest cemetery, and attributed to prisoners executed at Evin and Gohadash prisons during the summer of 1988. Amnesty goes on to ask as to why the Iranian authorities decided to identify marked individual graves for a limited number of, of victims, whilst hiding the burial location of thousands of other victims. But the answer to this mystery is that those thousands of other victims, as it puts it, were in fact Mojahedin fighters killed during Operation Mehrsad, the outcome of which Amnesty has deliberately and, de and deceitfully omitted from its report. Now, the report by Amnesty International on the events of 1988 in Iran was itself preceded by one authored by Jeffrey Robertson QC, the famous British human rights lawyer for the Abdul Rahman Buruman Foundation, which is an exiled opposition group. Unlike Amnesty, Jeffrey Robertson does actually state what happened during Operation Mehrsad, namely that on the 29th of July, the Mujahideen army beat a hasty retreat, leaving several thousand dead or else facing lynch mobs. He doesn't mention that, that, that those Mujahideen captured on the battlefield uh, were court-martialed and summarily executed, but perhaps he wasn't aware of that. He also discusses the reaction in Tehran to this invasion and almost sympathizes with the Iranian government. He states that it takes little imagination to understand the fury which must have inflamed the leaders of Iran in the last week of July, not so much at Saddam's predictable treachery, but at the treason of those Iranians who tried to take advantage of it. And he goes on to state that the treason of Rajavi's army, Masoud Rajavi being the leader of the Mujahideen, was by the decree of Khomeini imputed to the Mujahideen prisoners who were deemed collectively responsible for the treason of their leader. Now this completely detracts from Amnesty's contention that the Mujahideen prisoners were executed for their peaceful political beliefs and not because they were members of a terrorist organization in armed confrontation with the Iranian state fighting on behalf of a foreign enemy. Now, it is worth noting that Mr. Robertson himself does not accept the culpability of those Mojahideen prisoners uh, held in Iran through guilt by association. He contends that the majority of them had been incarcerated uh, from a time before the Mojahideen had begun their campaign of terrorism and violence. He also maintains that those Mojahideen who had committed acts of violence would already have been put to death. However, this is demonstrably false. Firstly, the Iranian authorities believed that the prisoners were not simply idle spectators of what was going on uh, in western Iran on the battlefield, but were rioting at the time and actively colluding with their comrades. Amnesty dismisses whether any communication channel would have been possible, but it also admits that the prisoners had contact with the outside world through family visits, phone calls and letters that were abruptly called to an end 
just after the invasion. Secondly, it is widely accepted that the prisons in Iran had swelled with Mojahedin convicted of acts of violence or at least being accomplices to acts of violence from the terror campaign that had lasted uh, seven years up until that point. Thirdly, Iran did not immediately execute uh, those receiving the death penalty. Uh, because of the appeals process, many prisoners were months or even years on death row. Moreover, the Iranian authorities didn't want to execute all the Mojahedin in the expectation that the group would cease its murderous activities and that many prisoners would have their sentences pardoned or commuted as part of a process of reconciliation with the government. Mr. Robinson, in fact, mentions that there was a pardon committee set up in January of 1988. The invasion of the Mujahideen army, however, effectively destroyed all prospects of any resolution. Amnesty contends that the fatwa of Khomeini, which ordered the judiciary to retry all of the Mujahideen prisoners for the treason of the group's Iraqi-backed invasion of Iran, was itself illegal. In the fatwa, Ayatollah Khomeini had decreed that only those who repented and dissociated themselves from the group would be spared execution. However, Amnesty does not seem to understand the constitution of the Islamic Republic. The supreme leader in Iran is the head of state and the ultimate judicial authority. He is the vali e fari the governor jurist, and his fatwa, namely his opinion, on any matter of Islamic law is legally binding, thereby making it hokma, a decree or order. In addition to this, Article 110 of the Constitution of the Islamic Republic allows the leader to delineate the general policies of the system and to supervise their impl implementation. As such, the fatwa was indeed one of these general policies, and so was legal. As well as using testimonies made under duress and intimidation, Amnesty relies heavily on an audio tape recording of the late Ayatollah Montezeri. The authenticity of this tape has not itself been verified. It appears scratchy and has clearly been reworked and edited in places, and so therefore the words may not be in their proper context. Suspiciously, the tape emerged in 2016, 28 years after the alleged events, and one has to wonder why it took so long for it to be released. In the recording, Ayatollah Montezeri protests the executions of prisoners and states that they amount to a very big crime of the state against its citizens. Now, between 1980 and uh, 1985, Montezeri was himself in favor of cracking down very hardly on the people's Mujahideen. However, since 1986, he had become increasingly estranged from Ayatollah Khomeini and the establishment of the Islamic Republic. By 1988, he had questioned virtually every major decision taken. Now, although he was clearly influential, being the designated successor to Khomeini, he himself was not involved in the process of retrying the prisoners for treason, and therefore whatever he says needs to be viewed with skepticism. Amnesty is adamant that the executions of the prisoners in 1988 amounted to extrajudicial killings, despite the fact that all of them were retried by a tribunal consisting of a Sharia judge, a prosecutor, and a representative from the Ministry of Intelligence. Uh, they were also charged with, with uh, Maharebe, which is waging war or, by extension, terrorism and treason, as according to Article 183 of the Islamic Penal Code. However, Amnesty regards these trials as being unfair because they do not conform with human rights law, specifically Article 11. However, the term extrajudicial uh, is a very technical and uh, precise one, and it just simply means that which has been authorized by a judge according to the law. It has no bearing on the fairness of the process. Uh, indeed, many uh, trials could be unfair. Evidence could not be allowed to be admitted. The judge could be biased and so forth. But that has no bearing on whether the outcome is judicial or not. And Amnesty actually regards every trial uh, conducted in Iran since 1979 as being unfair, and, uh, which makes you wonder why they're, they're focusing on, uh, on this episode. Now, the Iranian authorities have maintained that most of those executed were already on death row at the time, and so their retrial and execution merely expedited their sentence rather than changed it. And it's also true that the, they have also stated that each and every, the, the, the personal circumstances of each and every one of the prisoners was taken into consideration by the interrogators who passed this information to the tribunal for their judgment. 
and many were spared because of this careful deliberative process. Now, it is true that the prisoners were not given the presumption of innocence that Article 11 uh, stipulates, but that's because they were already uh, convicted. These were retrials, not first trials, and also it was obviously apparent that the group to which they were affiliated with uh, was in armed conflict against the state and had committed an act of treason in invading Iran with the support of Saddam Hussein. Now, the fact that so many were, in fact, spared and amnesty did elicit their testimonies is clear evidence that a judicial process was, was involved in that some people were spared and acquitted, others were condemned. There was no attempt, as Amnesty alleges, to simply exterminate all of the Mujahideen prisoners, regardless of their personal circumstances and culpability. Now, regarding the scale of the prison executions in 1988, Amnesty seems fairly convinced that at least 5,000 prisoners were executed, and it cites in support of this an internal database of the People's Mujahideen listing some 4,969 names on it. Uh, however, the PMO, uh, PMOI also claims in its uh, propaganda that up to 30,000 of its members were killed, which is, of course, a blatant exaggeration. But the only publicly available list is one put out by an anti-government outlet, Holy Crime, and that lists just 1,432 names for those executed in prison during 1988. The vast majority of the people on the list were members of the, of the People's Mujahideen, but it also, interestingly enough, includes names of members of other left groups like the Two Day Party, uh, who were on death row at the time, having been convicted for spying for the, for the Soviet Union. And this suggests that the list is, in fact, comprehensive. Now, if we add this tally of around 1,400 to the estimated number of three to 4,000 Mujahideen slain in battle, well, uh, or for that matter, executed shortly after being captured, this actually gives a figure of around 5,000. And that, of course, suggests that the Iranian authorities were right all along, that, uh, the, that the People's Mojid have added uh, those people who were killed during Operation Mersad to uh, a much smaller list of those who were executed in prison following uh, their retrial. Now, in addition to those Mojidin already in prison at the time, Amnesty alleges that hundreds who had been released before 1988 were rearrested around the time of the Operation Mersad, and that these people could be among those executed. It refers to such people as being forced disappearances and claims that uh, their families are not heard from them again. Now, one very plausible explanation to account for this is that in the run-up to Operation Eternal Light, many Mujahideen based in Iran left for Camp Ashraf, the People's Mujahideen's base in Iraq, to begin their preparations and training for the invasion. This is actually historically documented. Now, in the subsequent invasion of Iran, many of these people may well have been killed in battle during Operation Mersad. And even if they had survived, the leadership would have uh, encouraged them to cut off all ties to their family as part of the group's cult-like practices that include forced divorce and forced celibacy. Now, in summary, my final judgment and recommendations are the following five points. The first is that up to 70% of the 5,000 or so Mojahideen members killed in 1988 were actually slain on the battlefield or were summarily executed upon capture and court-martial. The second is that the remaining 30% were retried and ex executed for actively colluding in the treason of the Mojahideen's army in invading Iran with the help of Saddam Hussein's Iraq. The third point is that many of the executed prisoners were already on death row at the time for acts of violence, or at least serving as accomplices to violence, and thus would likely have been executed anyway without a pardon. The fourth point is the trials, whilst uh, clearly having shortcomings, were still legal and judicial. Many were spared and later released, and those are the people whom uh, Amnesty spoke to. Uh, fifth, in eliciting information from the members of the People's Mojahideen from their camp in Albania, where gross human rights abuses take place, Amnesty International is complicit, fully complicit, in these abuses, and those responsible for conducting the research at the camp in Albania need to be brought to account for this. My recommendation is that Amnesty supporters should immediately cancel their donations now in protest.
And finally, on a historical note, the events of 1988 in Iran have unfairly been compared to the massacre of political prisoners in revolutionary France in late 1792. In that instance, the Prussian army was descending on Paris, and the revolutionaries feared that if the Prussians took the capital, they would release thousands of political prisoners who would turn against them and destroy the revolution from within. Likewise, it has been suggested that Khomeini ordered the retrial of the Mujahideen prisoners not out of the need for justice, but out of revenge for the invasion of the army of their comrades with Saddam's help. This comparison is false because, firstly, the, pris the prisoners in Iran were mostly members of a terrorist group cooperating with a foreign enemy, unlike in France where they were mostly passive folks like priests and nobles. Secondly, the prisoners in Iran all received a formal judicial process before their execution, whereas in France they were simply garroted in their cells. However, both episodes highlight the need for maintaining public order through the harsh response of the authorities versus the rights of the individual. Communities also have a right to security as much as an individual has a right to justice. The outcome of the reign of terror in France, initiated by Maximilien Robespierre, who was himself a humanist and a believer in human rights, and the executions of unrepentant Mojini prisoners in Iran, served to purge society of harmful and reactionary forces that led to the establishment of calm and the beginnings of democracy. After the crushing defeat of the Mojahideen on the battlefield and the demise in prisons, the terror campaign which they had waged for seven years was dealt a near fatal blow. People felt safe again to walk on the streets. Civil society flourished, and Iran's reform movement would begin to take shape. As such, the political outcome was very positive as far as the Iranian people uh, is concerned, even though for the Mojahideen and their families, of course, it was a human tragedy.